Thank, Thank you for coming again. And we'll get to our story of the uh, of the North in with one more additional uh, talk. But I was asked to explain my uh, title here, and the first reason it the first part is that of course the North Pole and the South Pole are the farthest reaches of the Earth. They are uh, they are the most remote. No one has been there and they're the last places that civilization really uh, encounters. As for the last place on Earth, in the last moments of the, uh, of the exploration, they will have to, ex they think that there is something in the North uh, unexplored regions, and those, those things, those lands, don't exist. So that is the explanation for the last places not on Earth. The, in my previous talk, I, there were really two, part, two sections. One was the search for the Northwest Passage, and we got into talking about Franklin and the failed uh, t attempt to find that passage. And of course, for most purposes, that passage doesn't exist. Uh, geographically, there are lots of routes over the north uh, portion of Canada through the Ar archipelago there. Um, the, and the other portion of, is after the Northwest Passage proves to be uh, um, an impossible uh, course to the Orient, they, de uh, they decide to run for the North Pole. And the North Pole has been uh, of interest as a, as a goal of uh, Western society since, at least since Mary Shelley, where I started the last talk, um, and that's 1880, in 1800 approximately. This is just to remind you of what the Northwest, uh, what the, the polar region looks like, and the, you'll, you can once again see the this is the archipelago that they are all trying to get through. This is, of course, uh, Greenland. And the interesting part is that they, unlike any place else, they show this as, as snow covered or ice covered. And, and indeed, it becomes briefly an, an area of interest. Since they can't seem to get to the North Pole, they do a lot of Greenland um, uh, searches crossing Greenland on skis and, and, and other conveyances. Uh, I, I think Greenland becomes sort of a, a surrogate for not being able to reach the North Pole and it tends us uh, for a short while to explain what is going to happen after they get to the North Pole. They'll find something else to do. <laughs> This is Roald Amundsen, uh, a Norwegian, well, first a Swedish explorer, and then when the countries change, this country splits a, a, a Norwegian explorer. Uh, he's, this is a man that's really just born to be an explorer. He, from very early on, he sets his, his, his sights on, on uh, strengthening his body, familiarizing himself with uh, what to do in cold environments. Uh, his mother is not very happy about this, and she forces him to take go into uh, a course of medicine. But she dies, and he immediately becomes an explorer. <laughs> and his first, uh, his first enter enterprise is to get a small ship not one like the like Franklin's or uh, two huge Navy ships, but something in the order of maybe 40 feet, 50 feet long, maybe with a single rig, and he's going to find his way through the Northwest Passage. Now, the Northwest Passage at this point has been a, an abandoned interest for about 50 years, so it's it's certainly going to surprise everybody that somebody has found it. This is, uh, to give you a year, it's 1906. The, <coughs> on 
Amundsen uh, is not, not a very good student, and he's really, he never is very interested in the sciences that uh, is, are used to explain why people are out there. Uh, he's just an explorer, and, um, and eventually, to everybody's surprise, he will, he will somehow manage to gather to himself all the great prizes of being an explorer, and I'll explain that somewhat later. So this is where, this is the area that uh, the Franklin expedition tried to come through. Come, this is, off to the right is Greenland. Here he comes, they come to this point, and then down this way and through, excuse me, down this, this way. And at this point, Franklin go, tries to go through here. This is a modern photograph of the area. And so you can see that area is sort of heavily blocked by ice. And what Amundsen does is choose the lesser course and, and go down this way, which turns out to everybody's surprise to be a pretty much open course. And then he goes through here. And it's only possible to do this little portion with a small boat because there are reefs in there, and you go off here, and then off that way is Alaska. <laughs> so, uh, Amundsen is now the new person on the scene. The old person on the scene is Robert Peary, a Navy, a Navy man. He's, <laughs> it's weird, it, he's, for many people, a very unlikable person, uh, and it, that's going to cause him some hardship. Uh, it's hard to make him at times uh, uh, into a polar hero, but in any event, he's a Navy officer, and he's a great planner. He uh, knows how to set up uh, his storage, he knows how, he, how to decide what he's going to need and what he's not going to need, what to take, not to take. All that sort of issue is really uh, the result of his experiences in, in the Navy. Well, and he, when he gets to the pole, he develops what he calls the Peary uh, Plan. And it's how to, make, to do stages to the pole. This would do uh, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, Civil War hero, uh, general, proud. You know, he, Peary sets up one uh, stage, it's a big stage, a lot of men, and the next stage is a smaller stage, of, and it's fewer men, and there's a third stage, and then there's a last stage in which he should arrive at the pole. And his planning is so good that he determines that there's, he's going to need exactly 249 dogs. Uh, I don't know how you can plan down to that. But anyway, this is another picture of Piri. Uh, and this is, uh, he has done, he has done eight expeditions uh, in his, uh, in his northern career. Uh, he's the most experienced uh, adventurer out there. Everybody sort of like acknowledges this, this, whether they live in North America or whether they're uh, Europeans. He's 50, about 59 years, excuse me, 53 years old at this point, and you can see he's been, he's weathered. Uh, <laughs> and he's not too friendly. And uh, he's a grizzled veteran of, of Greenland and of the North, and he has failed numerous times. Uh, he's, a, he's a risk taker even at 50 some years old. He has lost almost all of his toes to frostbite at, by this point. His comment on it, well, that's what you have to do to get to the North Pole. That's, uh, he's, uh, he's up, for, up for the task, but at 53, it's probably going to be his last chance, and he has already failed at, the, at this once before. Uh, He's a man who will learn from the Inuits, where a lot of other people 
won't. He learns how to use how to sled. He learned, uh, and it's not an uh, I'm told not a very easy task to keep a, a section a group of dogs headed in the direction that you want them to go. He, uh, he's willing to let his dogs at the end of his um, on his return, oh, excuse me, I shouldn't say that, he's willing to feed his dogs to his dogs. So in these stages <laughs> that you have, the, the weakest dog will be fed to the healthiest dogs, and then the next stage they'll s select two more dogs. The, uh, the people who accompany these trips hate, always say that this is the worst part of their job because they come at become attached to their dogs. He knows how to build igloos. He knows what... Uh, how did, how did, well you can see from his dress here, he's accepted the, in, the Inuit form of attire and how, to, and what it does, unlike what the British were wearing before, is it, lots, it allows lots of air to circulate through, uh, um, around there, and so when they work, although they work extremely hard in doing, uh, pushing through the, uh, the snow and ice and over ridges and such, they don't, they don't sweat as badly as, with. And this, and I have to say one more thing. What this is a man dedicated to fame. He writes his mother as an early uh, explorer, and he says, "I'm go I'm going to go to Washington D.C. and meet people at all the highest ranks that I can. I'm not determined to have fame, not when I'm old, but now." Uh, and this is probably. Fame is an ambition is is the hidden quality that none of these men admit to, and pretty much when they become national heroes, it isn't discussed. This next picture is of his his helper, a uh, man that he picked up uh, early on in his career. Uh, his name is Matthew Henson, and he's he's a black man. Uh, he would have said Negro, but. Uh, we don't, the terms have changed in time. He's, his, one of his big advantages is, is that he knows how to speak Inuit, which Perry doesn't. And strangely enough, from what I've read, all across Canada and into, into uh, Siberia, the Inuit language is pretty much the same. How that's possible when you have small individual, uh, not even towns, but just groupings of, uh, over a, peer, over a path that long, I don't know. But he knows how to speak the, the Inuit languages, well, I should say dialects. Uh, he has no navigational skills, and I don't know why he didn't pick them up. Uh, and then in recent, most recent years, in the last 30 so years, his renown has sort of grown beyond that of even Perry's. The, uh, and there's a certain, self-congratulatory uh, portion to what his to his writings about how Perry was in the was in the sled when they got to the North Pole and that uh, he Hanson knew where the North Pole was uh, and that he was the first person to step on it and, the, and so everybody who's connected with these uh, achievements wants to get make sure that they have the credit that they, they feel they deserve. Uh, this is a picture of, of a, play, a spot that's close to the North Pole. They wanted some uh, hill up behind them. And most of the people in here, except for Hanson, are, are Inuits. And I think it's to per Perry's credit that when this picture is published in the various other um, afterwards, he identifies by name all these Inuit participants, where most other people just would refer to him as an, as, uh, an Eskimo uh, uh, helper of some sort. Perry's claim to the North Pole is doubted by some people, but uh, well, we'll see, it, it becomes uh, generally accepted. But in 1968, because it was doubted by some, the National Geographic Society employed a, a northern um, trekker who knew the navigation to look at, the, at Perry's claim. And he came away with 
couple of comments. One is that Perry is traveling too fast in the last few sections or the last few days of his uh, of, uh, of the trek to the pole, and that doesn't look very good. And so that it, he, he, the implication is that he knows that he's behind schedule and he's uh, going to run out of of what he needs, including dogs. Uh, the but the other thing is that he thinks that from near Perry's uh, Perry's numbers, he thinks that actually Perry only got within 30 or 60 miles of the pole. And that in recent years has caused a lot of the writings to say that Perry never got to the North Pole. And then there's always other people who say 30 to 60 miles, well, that's close enough, and then, you know, something that's a couple of thousand, fifteen hundred or so uh, miles. The uh, you can sort of you can make your own assessment if that's good enough. But I'll point out that at fifteen miles a day, which is what they were doing, that's four day, Sixty miles is four days. So the issue is is just not going to go away. Paul. Oh. How would they know when they got to the North Pole? Uh, <laughs> well, they they have they use mostly sextants, and the sextant is a way of spotting something in like a star, more likely the sun, and uh, well. Let's say you're at the equator. I'll give you an idea of how a sextant works. And if you're at the equator and it's noon and the, uh, the sun is directly above you, you, can, you will know it. If it's not directly above you at noon, you're not at the step. You're not where you That would only be true at the equinox. The sun wouldn't be above, directly above you, even if you're at the equator, if it's not at the equinox. Oh, right. Okay. And like well, the solstice, it would be above the Tropic of Cancer at the okay. summer solstice, for example. Yeah. Let's try the North Pole. <laughs> <laughs> if you're at the North Pole and the North Star is directly above you, at 90 degrees from the horizon, you're at the North yeah. Pole. Okay. And is that, is that sort of clear? Yeah. I yeah. think there were already uh, navigational tables for uh, other navigators that showed, uh, as Henry was pointing out, uh, mm -hmm. where the sun ought to be at different dates. Yeah. So he probably was using those as well as a sextant reading. Could be. Uh, but they, they can, by this point, 1908, 1909, they, could, they have enough geographical and, and skill with instruments to know exactly where they are. Well, close to where they are. Um, this is Frederick Cook. And Frederick Cook is a, and also a very experienced uh, explorer. He's a, uh, he has uh, gone to the Antarctic. He's been there when it was his boat, not his boat, on a boat that was frozen in. He's, tried, he's learned from the Inuit, as, as uh, most of these people have. He's, uh, he's the great uh, teacher of, of, the, of Amundsen uh, when the, uh, they meet again. Uh, he's the, and he has a, a very mixed uh, reputation. He's a doctor. He's claimed to have climbed uh, Mount McKinley, which we now call Denali. And uh, there are people who say that's bogus. So he's already in a, um, unsettled, has an unsettled reputation. And he's a doctor. And he has worked for Peary. And on Peary's failed attempt in, uh, to reach the pole, uh, the, no, excuse me, at an earlier trip, uh, Frederick Cook has had to set Peary's leg, which was broken uh, by the tiller on their boat, 
and it has been broken in two places. So those two men know each other, and some of them, uh, but they're going to have a huge fight. Uh, <laughs> when they, uh, Perry comes back and, uh, to, from the North Pole, he immediately finds out that Cook has claimed that to be there a year, a year earlier. And uh, this, and the, the public and the newspapers have to decide who's the, who should have the honor. The New York Herald says it's, it's, uh, it's Cook. The New York Times says it's Perry. And the public is surveyed about who they uh, <laughs> believe. Uh, on, and on the basis of really no information, they make the, most of them seem to choose Cook because he's a much more affable, likable <laughs> person. Uh, one thing that Cook has problems with is he doesn't have any documentation. And the reason he doesn't have any documentation is because he's packed it all up and give it to a man oh, named Whitney. And Whitney uh, tries to come back from uh, to the New York area on a boat, and the boat is owned by Perry. Oh. Perry says, Cook, none of the Cook's stuff is coming on my boat. <laughs> and so Whitney leaves it with an Eskimo, uh, an Inuit, and uh, it's never seen again. And whether it ever existed, we don't know. But it's Perry's <laughs> argument that Cook went two days off of shore, settled down for a year, and came back and made his claim. And in time, Perry wins this argument. He has the institutions behind him. He has a few more explorers <laughs> who back them. And uh, Cook becomes sort of the goat in this uh, argument <laughs> over time. And then he, he is involved in some financial sh uh, problems or shenanigans, and he's, he's, in, he's in prison, and his reputation goes to zero. Um, but for a brief while, Cook is, an, is the, the person who is the uh, champion of the Arctic, and he comes back to Brooklyn, and there's 100,000 people turn out to see him, and uh, fame is his, and then slowly erodes away. And over the 70 so years since then, uh, it's up to about 1980, Peary is the person who's given all the credit for what's happened. Uh, these people, Cook and Peary, they're much the same. They're both fame seekers. But I think we, the audience for all this, are involved in this. We are, we are the fame givers to these people. <laughs> we make choices about who we want to uh, give the credit to. We, give, we decide who we want to associate with. We're sort of self-congratulatory in <laughs> saying, I, I choose this person, I choose this country. And I think nationalism comes is a, a, slow, uh, a close kin to this sort of fame giver quality that we have. The, this is a, uh, a published uh, map that's public, uh, that comes from the New York Times, and it shows the, uh, the path of, of Peary here, and it shows the path of Cook here. And what's going to interest us in the future on this is these little things. Uh, hmm? They are Crocker Land and let's see, Bradley Land. Mm -hmm. And the, the next people who will be interested in the Arctic will be interested in land that no one has seen before. The, now, this isn't, these aren't the only little bits of land that they suspect are out there. There's Keenan land, Sanikoff land, uh, Cook land, uh, and it just, the list just goes on and on. Uh, everybody thinks that they have some sort of 
credit they will earn if they were the first to see the new land. Uh, people suspect that there is something called cropper land. Uh, and why they suspect this is because this is Cook's, uh, excuse me, this is Perry's uh, starting point. But in the, the year, a couple of years previous, when he had failed at it, he had decided to walk off to mm. this point, uh, Cape Thomas Hubbard. And he looks northwest and he sees Crocker Land. <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> he names it after one of the supporters who has given him $50,000 and uh, to, and he needs, he needs in his failed trip to come back with something and so he creates Crocker Land. Well, how do we know that this is bogus? Well, his di he, he kept his diary which says, and at Cape, Cape Thomas Hubbard, I looked out and I didn't see anything. There's no land out there. And when he published his book about this trip, he, his first draft doesn't include anything about Crocker land. So we're pretty sure that he's deliberately lying about this. And what he hopes is that Crocker, with his name on this piece of property, will support his next adventure, which of course is this, quote, successful one. The Crocker doesn't take the bait on this, by the way, <laughs> because Crocker lives in San Francisco, and in 1906 in San Francisco, well, it seems most of you know what happened. <laughs> this is what Don McMillan, uh, <laughs> Donald McMillan is a one of Peary's supporters. Uh, on the trip. He's a, uh, he's a lieutenant who sets up one of the stages for the, the uh, for going north and he absolutely believes in Peary and so th that gives you an idea of just how solid Peary's reputation is. Uh, he, and he decides, well, I'll go off and prove that Crocker, Crocker land exists and it will also prove that, that Cook is wrong because Cook would have walked right past Crocker Land, and if he doesn't, and he do, doesn't say anything about it there. But when I find it, that will show that Cook, Cook lied. Well, he, it's not that simple, and <laughs> he he goes out to Cape Thomas uh, Hubbard, and he sees something out there, and his his Inuit guide says, Mirage. No, nope, there's nothing out there. So they both venture out a couple days on the ice, several, many days on the ice, and they never they keep going west and west, and they never find anything. Uh, that, of course, isn't very helpful for Cook's reputation. And it's the end. You would think that would be the end of Crocker Land, but it is not. <laughs> and I'm going to use the word Crocker Land to describe basically anything in the Arctic that they think might exist because uh, not having a name for all these sightings that Apollo isn't, isn't very useful. The, the thoughts about the, uh, the poles immediately reverse. To, you, on the right you see the North Pole, on the left we have the Antarctic, uh, the North Pole has always been more, more interesting because the population centers are in the North. But everybody's sites turn to the South Pole and wh where, there's a, where there's land. And so this is a picture of Amundsen's boat and uh, Scott's boat, both uh, tied up to a, an ice shelf, basically a piece of floating glacier that has slipped out into the, the ocean. Uh, Scott has long planned his trip to the south. Uh, because in, and what it means for England is that England is now, re, or excuse me, Britain has now returned 
to Arctic explorations after the disasters of the Franklin. Uh, Amundsen is there by chance, and when Peary returns from the North Pole, Amundsen is prepared and doesn't know about it. Excuse me. When Peary returns from the North Pole and Amundsen doesn't know about it, he is <laughs> Amundsen is preparing uh, to go to the North Pole. And as soon as he hears about this, he just, he knows that he doesn't want to be the second or the third person to go to the North Pole. He's also a fame seeker. There's no fame involved in being the third person to the pole. And so he just, uh, but he has backers. He has to re reward. He has. He hasn't told his crew, and what he does is he gets them all on the boat and he sneaks out of the harbor at night when the, nobody knows and sets the course for the South Pole. Uh, it's, it's not the, and in the European setting of the time, this is far from a, a, an honest behavior. So none of these people can really live up to our our best exploration expectations of heroes. <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> this is a picture of Robert Scott. He's been to the South Pole, Pole region once before. He doesn't have a lot of experience. He's a very with uncommunicative man, and so he has a, a crew, a large crew of people who. Uh, who, a large number of people in his crew who don't really like him, and there's a lot of uh, tension going on. And it's a picture, of, of course, of his wife. This is a picture of Amundsen. This Amundsen is, of course, this. He, he's excuse me. This is a picture of Cook. Uh, I'm going to get this right last. This is a picture of Scott's trip. Scott has decided no dogs. Uh, he doesn't like the idea, the, the, the way that dogs fit into the trip. He doesn't want to feed dogs to dogs. He doesn't want to eat dogs. And so he decides ponies. Uh, and he also decides on having some mechanical uh, vehicles as well. And neither ponies nor the mechanical vehicles work very well at all, and they will become liabilities. The ponies become liabilities because they can't take, although they're Siberian ponies, they're, they can't take the cold, and at night they have to dig trenches to put the ponies out of the wind. Uh, he's made a lot of bad decisions, and uh, those will come back and eventually haunt him. The, and he doesn't have enough experience. This is a picture of the Amundsen group. Eight dogs, a very small sled, a, uh, and one driver to every sled. Amundsen knows that if you put a dog, uh, somebody out in front skiing, and the Norwegians are the few people, people on earth who know how to ski at the time, uh, the dogs will chase after the skier, and you will, do, you, and you will outrun anybody on foot by probably about 50 percent. The, the other thing is that the, the English think when, the, when it really gets down to it, they, they prefer to haul the, uh, their sleds by, by hooking, manning them, manhauling the sleds themselves. Uh, and eventually, the they will, all the people that eventually go to the pole will die. They, uh, they will find the, uh, that they're exhausted before they get back to the boat. And they will, uh, and because planning has been sort of a uh, hit and miss with this group, they will, uh, the people that are to come out and meet uh, Scott and the others at, the, at a hut haven't done so and they haven't brought food and the, the entire polar uh, the group that reaches the pole will starve to death and succumb to uh, exhaustion. Uh, they, they all write letters home before they, from their little hut, uh, I'm speaking of Scott still, 
uh, they write letters home and they, dis they uh, tell them uh, what has happened, that they don't mind what, ha ha what has, their fate has been. Uh, they are determined to have honorable deaths. And I think this goes back to the Franklin story again. They're not, there isn't any cannibalism in this group. And they all are going to die with, uh, after, uh, as, as martyrs. And they are, they are going to show some endurance in the face of adversity. Uh, Scott's explanation constantly is uh, that they've experienced bad luck. And so Scott has not has done very well uh, in the years since then. He did very well up till maybe about 1950 in the, the, uh, amongst historical writers and the public of, of showing a determination and honorableness in, in the adversity. And then people start examining his, uh, his bad decisions, ponies, the, uh, mechanical contraptions, uh, not using proven methods, uh, um, and his own personal uh, failure to, to bond with his, his uh, party. And so his reputation plunged again. And then in the last couple of years, uh, they, they realized people have gone through the papers again and seen that the, uh, it's people in his party who failed him, to failed to bring the food to their uh, meeting place. Um, This is Amundsen at the pole. And what you can see. Amundsen at the pole. It says Scott. It says Scott. Well, I mislabeled it. Uh, <laughs> okay. This is, I'm pretty sure this is. I'm pretty sure this is Amundsen. These people look pretty healthy and, and uh, for all their exertion. Anyway, in any event, Amundsen set up this tent, and when, of course, Scott gets to the pole, he sees this tent and uh, realizes that he is a month behind, and uh, and he he will lose this race. So, which pole is it? We're, yes, we, have we shifted now to the South Pole? Yes, we are definitely at the South Pole. Oh, you talk about that. There are skis there. Scott didn't use skis, so it's Amundsen. Well, these are probably, yeah, there are a pair of skis poking up, as yeah. you can see at the very bottom. So um, since Scott didn't use his skis, uh, this, is, this is definitely Amundsen. I'm sorry about the labeling. <laughs> We're going to. So we're going to have to shift back to the North Pole again. Uh, this is after the skis. After the spotting of Crockerland, there's a lot of speculation again of what is going on in the middle of the Arctic, and they have no idea, of course. And the this is the picture of the Alaskan coast as you can see. And the idea, the reason that there's one, there's speculation, one of the reasons that there's speculation that there's something out there is this is the area where all the sailors, excuse me, all the whalers want to go. They want to set up here and, uh, and whalers, I'm not sure, are the most the people you really want to believe. But they see geese and ducks headed north from the coast of Alaska, and they say, there's got to be something out there. There's got to be land. Those ducks know something. And <laughs> they don't. And there is a, a man who's in charge of tides at the uh, Coastal and Geodetic uh, Agency in Washington, D.C. And he says, well, from what I can see of the evidence, those tides at the North Pole are too, uh, around the North Pole, are too small. There must be some archipelago or large island, or maybe a continent out there in the, uh, in the hidden away in the ice that is constricting the flow of water into and out of the, the North Pole. And he, 
Oh, Henry? Oh, sorry. And, and so there is, at least in the scientific world thinking, there might be something out there that they can't see. Uh, from, from my own part, I've tried to understand the tides of the North Pole. I've asked some oceanographers. I've never gotten an, an, an explanation that I've really understood. To me, thinking about the, the sun and the moon moving the tides around, there shouldn't be much water moving at the North Pole. But the so this is a this is a pair of men who on their own fund their own trip and they set up <coughs> they set up in Alaska off the coast and their theory is there's something out there in the North Pole. These are two young adventurers and they're going to prove it by looking at the bottom. And what I mean by looking at the bottom, they're going to go further and further out and find how deep the ocean is. And the argument is that this is what the, what the, the bottom normally looks like in cross-section. You have a sort of a, a shallow uh, area, maybe a hundred or so feet deep, and then it will plunge because it's in, off a continent, but not from in other circumstances. And if there is an island close by, it won't plunge. It will, the island is part of the con as part of the continent, and so the they take a boat out, and they're up, uh, they're constantly moving out. The boat gets crushed. They go out and tense, and they. Uh, they have a little winch that they drop this line to the bottom and they pull up. And at 65 miles out, the bottom drops away. And it means, of course, there isn't anything out there. Uh, it drops from 160 feet to 2,500 feet within the course of a mile and a half. And, and it's not what they expect, and they are extremely disappointed about this, but they accept the results. But the person who doesn't accept the results is this young guy that they've hired named Viljamur Stephenson, who has studied some anthropology in the U.S. and has, has joined them. The, he rejects the idea that the, the bottom shows what's out there. And I have to say, I find the whole notion of measuring the bottom as a way of finding what's out 100 or 300 or 400 miles off the shore a really ingenious idea. The, uh, but what it says is not, is not acceptable to him. And he spends most of the rest of his life, uh, his polar life anyway, looking for the uh, uh, for evidence for what I've called Crockerland. Uh, he spends five years with the Inuits uh, and he's, into, he's after all an, an anthropologist and uh, he finds and he also finds a number of Canadian islands. These are sort of s low places off, just slightly offshore from the in the archipelago region that we saw to the east. The, and so I'm going to break a little bit into the thread and add something that we sh uh, we need to, to take account of. These are uh, the women in this in these stories. Uh, the the Inuit women that you see, you see here. None of these communities are very big. There are you know a few families in most cases uh, because there isn't enough food uh, or, or wildlife to support big families. But it's well known here then, and it was well known now, that the mating practices of uh, the Inuit were not the ones that most that people back in New York practiced. <laughs> and of that, yeah, back in, women uh, were traded between husbands and uncles. Women, women were ways of making bonding with the. Uh, other people in the community, women were ways of bonding to uh, people in other tri or other communities, and 
these are these are very they may be strange to us, but they are very successful within the Indian within the Inuit pop, population. And they also have mating practices with white uh, explorers who come through. And so Piri has a, uh, uh, an Inuit uh, wife. Henson had an Inuit wife. Stephenson, a whole <laughs> lot of people had Inuit uh, contact. Uh, Piri's real wife, and back from Washington, D.C., must have suspected that something was wrong because she went up there once when uh, he didn't really, he didn't know that she was coming and found out what was going on. Uh, Amundsen, Amundsen is a different case. He prefers the wives of friends. <laughs> But, they, but uh, speaking of wives, they, this era that I've gone through must left hundreds of widows behind because these, the chances of coming back from the pole is about, you know, just, you know, like 75%, maybe even lower than that. Uh, there are lots of myths that float around, and I, I'm not an anthropologist by any means, but there are myths about elderly uh, women going out into the snow and freezing to death so as not to, to have, not taking away food from other family members. And there are, and there are, and I guess now that's not generally given too much credence. Uh, there, is, there are stories about infanticide for the same reason and that, that may or may not be true again. This is a picture of, of Stephenson. Uh, became quite famous of him uh, coming back from a uh, seal hunt. Uh, he's, he is, has become sort of the super Inuit person who takes Inuit's tasks and, and sort of uh, beefs them up with a lot of uh, Western experience. Uh, he, he, he is now, however, in, a, in uh, the person who s tells the, w the West a lot about what Inuit existence is like. And he writes a number of books, and some of them have crazy things in them. One of them, or the most craziest probably, is he writes a book called The Friendly Arctic. And <laughs> The Friendly Arctic, where it's cold, but, not, but pretty nice. Friendly Arctic, where there's enough food for everybody. Friendly Arctic, where there's a lot of space for everybody, and we should be interested. We should all be interested in it. It's a good place to go. Amundsen, when he hears about this, thinks it's just laughable idea. You know, he knows what the Arctic is like. It's this barren. Uh, it's, it's basically a desert with a on, on top of an ocean. Right? So the. Uh, Another one of, of Stephenson's Arctic promotions is that there is a northwest course of empire over thousands of years of history. And that this, uh, at one time, the center of the learned world was Cairo, and then it was Athens or Rome, and then it's, you can see it's going north, and it's then into France, and that maybe eventually it will be Petersburg or something like that. <laughs> Uh, but the point is to say that there, the, the Mediterranean, uh, which is the center of, of the ancient world, uh, is a model for what the future will be centered around the Arctic Ocean. The Arctic Ocean, the great end cities of the future will make the Arctic Ocean a a center of commerce and uh, civilization will center around it. And we're still waiting. <laughs> Steph Hitzinson also talks, uh, some of his writings talks about uh, blonde Eskimos with, and implied in that is, is his suggestion, and it was that of others too, that these Eskimos were blonde and that because they had made it with Norsemen centuries before. before. And I don't think anybody believes that's the reason that they're blonde Eskimos around. <laughs> but I, want, I don't know the, what the present explanation is. This is the picture of the Carlock. 
the car luck is Stephenson is uh, Stephenson's sponsor is the Canadian government in this er, in these early years, and he uh, gets them to uh, provide money to buy a ship. And he buys a rotten old uh, whaler and puts, pushes it has it uh, sailed into through the Bering Strait into uh, the Arctic Ocean, where it gets frozen in the ice. It's uh, not only uns unsuitable, but it's uh, it's not it's it's going to be crushed sort of once very soon after it gets into the ice. They, and what they do is they move everything off uh, the ship just in case. And Stephenson says, "I'm going to go out and hunt, get hunts for some food and bring it back." And when he comes back to where he thinks it should be, it's gone. And instead of there being an eastward current in, uh, in uh, north of the Bering Straits, there's a westward current. And as a result, he doesn't find the boat. And he says, oh, well, too bad. I'll go off and finish my task the, that the Canadians have hired me to do. Well, the people on the boat are in desperate straits. And about a third of them die in the process of trying to get to, get to Siberia. It does Stephenson's reputation no good. He's the remaining 18 people tried uh, are just uh, furious at what he, what he has done to them. This is and this is probably the last of his strange ideas. Oops. Let's go back. He decides, well, off the coast of Russia is, and you see it in this circle, is a, an island. No one's on it. Uh, Russia is hardly present in, uh, in Siberia, at, or at least, at least the Pacific end of si uh, Siberia. And so he says, Let's occupy it and take it for ourselves. And so he sends, on his own, he's, he sends five people to go occupy the island. Uh, the four men and uh, a woman. And the four men die. Uh, the woman is, is eventually rescued. Uh, the, one of them lived, lived down here, and one of the four men lived down here in, in Fremont. Uh, but in any event, the, they're, they're young men, they don't have the experience, and it's a crazy idea, so crazy that the Canadian government won't have anything to do with it. Uh, the British government, which has a, a authority at the time, won't have anything to do with it, and uh, the whole idea dies. But what is Stephenson known for today, and, he, and his work is known? He called, he, well, first he becomes sick, and uh, he has to go back east and become, uh, he joins the Dartmouth faculty, and he tells people about what it's like to be an Inuit, and you eat only meat, and people say, you eat only meat? Well, this is the Atkins diet. Oh. <laughs> and so the, some medical authorities put him in, in a hospital, and they watch him carefully, and they give him only meat, and he does just fine. Uh, you don't eat just only meat, you eat a lot of fat, you eat a lot of whole other, th a few other things. But anyway, you do, uh, you, he did just fine, the Inuit do just fine. And so there's a remnant of Stephenson uh, out there in our own day. <laughs> and this is the last idea of Stephenson, and his ideas are about as fuzzy as this map, I'm sorry, sorry to say, but the, uh, this is a, a picture of the Arctic once again, with the pole in the center. Uh, here we have Greenland. Here we have the Canadian to uh, archipelago and to Alaska. Here we have Siberia starting. And he sa says, "Let's call. Let's think about where we haven't been. Let's. There is a third pole, a pole of inaccessibility." <laughs> the area where it's hardest to get to. 
the area that's farthest from any land, the farthest from any uh, living community. And that's the place we should be looking for this, uh, for this, for land. And it's, uh, and the, he doesn't give him, I have never run across yet an explanation of why he's so sure about land out there. The whalers have their geese, the, uh, the, the tide expert down in Washington DC has his explanation that the tides are too small. But this is where we're gonna have to call it a quits today, and we'll see what happens to the goal of inaccessibility in, in the next lecture. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. If you have any questions, of course, I'll, I'll give it a try. Al. Uh, on the slide where you showed the women, yes. it might be worth showing it again because the kids have no clothes. No. No, they don't, the kids don't have any clothes. So it must be they pretty warm. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know what the temperature is there. <laughs> Do okay. you know where the Canadians got the name Carlock from? It was Carlock. I don't know the name Carlock but in any other situation. No. Yeah. Well, thank you once again for joining us. Thank you.